Welcome to Hot Chips 30. Keynote 2. Adaptable Intelligence. The Next Computing Era. Okay, um, I've got the great pleasure of introducing an old friend, Victor Ping, who I've known for more than 25 years. Um, Victor has been a, in the chip design business for a long time. Uh, he worked on the, uh, one of the most famous processors, the DEC Alpha 21264, and then he uh, joined MIPS in the 1990s, uh, where he rapidly rose from VP of engineering, becoming uh, a great chip designer. Victor combines two things that I think are absolutely crucial. He's a great chip designer, and he's a great leader. And those capabilities are absolutely crucial to get success in this industry and designing challenging chips. In 2008, he joined Xilinx, uh, initially as the VP of products, rose to COO, and since January of 2018 has been the CEO. What I like about that story is it's wonderful to see a nice guy finish at the top of the pile for a change. Uh, unlike what's happening in Washington. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> so Victor's going to talk about adaptable intelligence. And I think as we uh, think about the slowdown and the end of Moore's Law, the complete destruction of Dennard scaling, um, I think a lot of us feel, and I think it's widely understood, that domain-specific architectures are going to have to be the future. That's going to be, have to be the way we get performance and we get power efficiency out of these architectures. The thing that's important to understand about DSAs is the space, the algorithms that you have, and the knowledge you have to exploit from the algorithms and the applications is critical to getting that higher level of efficiency. But it's a domain that's rapidly changing. AI is in its infancy. The ML breakthrough is only a few years old. It's changing rapidly. And that's why I, I think FPGAs have a particularly critical role to play as we begin to change those architectures. So please join me in welcoming Victor Pang for his keynote lecture. Thanks, John. That was really generous. Yeah, thanks. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really great to be here, and thank you, John, for such a generous introduction. I uh, hope I actually could live up to that billing. Um, but yeah, it's really great to be here to talk about uh, where I think computing is going. And I have to confess that on a personal note, when I was reflecting about the past you know, 40 plus years and thinking about what things are going ahead, you know, it just reminds me about uh, how lucky I am, and I'm sure many of you feel the same thing, to be you know, a small part of that, because I, I think it's just been a remarkable journey already. And the good thing is it's getting even more interesting now because of a confluence of things, which I'll talk about. So uh, let's just start with, you know, we've been talking as an industry for literally decades about how the world's going to become smart and connected. So now maybe a, a more uh, articulate way to talk about this is pervasive intelligence. And the exciting thing is it's really happening now, right? So, and that's intelligence from the cloud to the edge and to the endpoints. By the way, some people tend to dichotomize this just between cloud and edge. I tend to think that's really not enough granularity. So for me, really, we're going to talk about endpoints, edge, and cloud. Uh, just to give you an example of that, because you, know, you, you see this graphic, and we all know that you know, our homes are becoming smart, our cars, factories, cities, uh, all the infrastructure, both communications as well as computing. Um, so in terms of, obviously, cloud is cloud. Edge, in the context of, say, smart automobiles, would be the car itself. You know, I'd consider a vehicle because it's got multiple sensors, cameras, LIDAR, radar. Those are the endpoints. So there's intelligence. It's all fully connected. It's really happening. And as John alluded to, it's in really, really early days, especially from the perspective of today, intelligence not only means that there's some sort of processor at some level, in many cases in SOC, uh, but also because all these applications are having some form of 
artificial intelligence, typically machine learning of some form, um, also being integrated, and it's in really early days. So the reason why this is so exciting is not only because it's already had an impact, I think, on people's daily lives, but because it's just emerging, and it's actually going to have really profound impacts on people's lives um, because change is happening at an exponential rate. And I think there's been a lot of things discussed about this. Uh, you know, this is just one graph about the explosion of data being generated, thanks to you know, billions of cameras, um, everybody's cell phones, and also inexpensive sensors as that gets deployed. So this data is being generated, you know, I guess, depending on who you look at, 10 plus zettabytes a year. Most of it's unstructured. It's sort of a race behind it to sort of structure it, tag it, and so forth, so that we could get some more value out of this data. But it's an unbelievable exponential, and that's going to continue. So of course, that getting some value out of that um, usually means processing it in some form to extract that information from just the raw data. And that's driving, this is not an exponential, but that's driving quite a strong growth rate. This just happens to be uh, hard to see all the details, but it's a number of servers in hyperscale data centers. So data centers are being scaled out, of course, you know, more significantly than anything we've ever seen. The com computation as well as storage and memory is increasing. And the capability so far has been able to keep up. If you look at the processing and the total storage in these data centers, that is moving at an exponential rate. And again, I think this is a great opportunity as demonstrated by this exponential. And I know it's an eye chart, but that's basically the combined market capitalization of the leaders in the hyperscale data center. And that's just one facet of this pervasive intelligent world, because of course, that doesn't even talk about communications infrastructure, or about what's happening in the revolution in automotive and so forth. So everything looks great, right? Up and to the right, exponential growth. It's kind of like every startup's uh, business plan. Um, but there's one really, really big exponential, as John alluded to, and, um, and has talked about, is that's been serving the industry well for well over 40 years, and now is running out of gas, and that is Moore's Law and Denard Scaling. Um, you know, much has been said about this. A couple of things I just wanted to point out is that this is what's ingrained in all of us, you know, even outside of the tech industry, just everyday consumers to expect faster, better, cheaper, right? Every year, anything electronic in nature, we all have this expectation as though it really were a physical law, right? That the products we get for the same price will be so much more capable, so much more better, or for the same kind of capability to be significantly cheaper like the next Christmas season or whatever. So it's pretty profound when you say this engine is no longer working for us. The other thing I'd like to point out is we got that faster, better, cheaper, not only because of process technology, that's a big piece of it, but it's never been just process technology. And you see that by you know, the blocks talking about we moved in the 80s from Cisco architectures, which obviously predate all the way to the mainframe era, um, to risk architectures, from risk architectures to multi-core architectures, including you know, multiple, multiple threading and so forth. And then we started to enter into this phase where that still wasn't keeping up with the compute demands from that exponential growth in data and other kinds of processing. And so we're looking at more heterogeneous systems. So if you allow me just to indulge, John talked about, he was kind enough to mention Alpha as my first product. Actually, I got out of school in the early 80s. Um, so just to give you an idea, I, I've actually worked on each one of these. So that's not actually my first project. That was a two micron VAX chipset, not even a microprocessor. It was multiple chips to do the full VAX instruction set. Um, maybe we were a little slow learners at DAC, even though it was a fantastic place to be. Uh, did another sys processor. That is a uh, full microprocessor. Um, then we did a couple alphas. John mentioned he nicely put it uh, so that it looks like I'm a younger person than I am. <laughs> and that was fantastic. You know, that really had all the features of out of order, all kinds of speculation, all kinds of prediction, fundamentally doing everything you can to keep up that performance, extracting the, the very last bit of instructional level parallels and speculating like hell, um, and to keep it going. So again, it's not just the process technology, it's always been innovation in architecture as well. Now, change it up, and when I came out to California, 
worked at SGI, but then went with the MIPS group. And the interesting thing about this, other than it's for the first time I decided to use the uh, nanometer uh, unit as opposed to archaic thousands of nanometer microns, um, but it's really interesting because at, at that point, one of the things that when you're doing IP and now for more embedded applications is you have to design to a very different PowerPoint. Um, you still want to get a lot of performance because the kind of cores that and applications we were going were, tended to be a little bit more performance oriented, but you really had to worry about power to a large degree. And that actually forced architectures that were far more simple, even though we knew quite well how to do more advanced architectures. So, Again, all the speculation, that's really a big uh, waste of both area as well as power. And then, uh, by the way, there's no grand plan. It just so happened that I went to ATI, became AMD, did a few GPUs, and finally, uh, for the last 10 years, I've been at Xilinx and now doing um, FPJs as well as these Zinc SOCs, and in a bit in the future, I'll talk about the, the next generation of uh, product. So for me, this really um, resonates. I've actually experienced this challenge of driving performance, going to the next process node, as well as balancing power. Which brings me to the other exponential that's actually a challenge. And again, this has been it's quite well known, which is that the power density problem is increasing exponentially. And that across everything from cloud to the edge to endpoints truly is what's limiting, for the most part, application, real application performance. And, and really, that's true. It was true from when I was involved with IP cores. It was true when I was at DEC, when we were building these big uh, machines that were in data center environments. Um, and it's true for the FPGAs that we do today. And uh, it, it's the only solution now, and if you kind of integrate this together, is that the demand for computing is greater than it's ever been. Moore's law and scaling is not working. You're faced with this exponential curve in power density, which is limiting your system performance. So architecture is really your main lever. Another way to kind of look at this is, for most of the, uh, the last 40 plus years, compute was focused on CPUs and microprocessors, and it went through that progression of architectures as we discussed. Um, I think that kind of started running out of gas in the 2000s. So I think since the 2010 period, things started, did start moving to what heterogeneous systems where the computing was split between the general purpose processor. Now you had some, what I broadly call as fixed hardware accelerators. And, um, that could be a GPU, it could be other kinds of ASSPs, like an MPU, um, and certainly this would have been a resurgence of ASICs, particularly around machine learning accelerators. And we're still in this sort of realm, because as we all know, um, for quite a while, uh, there's been very little startup activity, but one of the reasons why there's actually new investment in silicon is because of people architecting new approaches to deal specifically mainly with machine learning. But our perspective is domain-specific architectures is definitely the, the right, in fact, the inevitable overall solution. But there's really great power in doing that on a physical hardware platform that's reconfigurable, adaptable. OK, so that's where Today's FPGAs, as well as our Zinc products, again, that's an, those products are not familiar with it, have multi-core SOCs integrated together with a programmable fabric plus other uh, significant processing resources. And in the future, which I'll talk about a bit more, is uh, product architecture called ACAP, or I'd say category. And the thing about th this adaptability is that it allows you to instantiate, if you will, many DSAs in the form of overlay architectures so that you can cover a wide range of applications as well as accelerate the whole application, not just one portion of it like machine learning. Um, and in addition to that, allow you to, to bring new innovations to market very rapidly. Looked at another way, right? If you look at the early days of computing, I mean, you're talking about mainframes um, for a period which isn't even worth taking up uh, the, the, the period of time, many computers and, and, super, and many supercomputers 
But you know, these were uh, deployments, if you, if you look at it, of how broadly these things were deployed. They were like collectively you know, on order of millions. Now, when things moved to the PC era, you were now talking about hundreds of millions of units. The mobile era got us to low billions, to maybe, uh, for, for those of us who carry maybe multiple <laughs> screens, small screens, you know, maybe about a 10 billion. You know, the new era that we're talking about now, this era of pervasive intelligence, you're definitely going to be in the multiple tens, eventually over cracking 100 billion devices. And that's, you know, again, that's everything from IoT devices to sensors in cars, in streets and factories, um, infrastructure in cars, bridges, buildings. Um, so not only is this an enormous number of devices which are all connected, which need intelligence, but they will be deployed across the planet. And so when you have that, you just cannot have that be fixed because you can't predict what all the needs are going to be as you deploy this, and you don't want to have to deliver new capability to that infrastructure by changing the physical devices, right? So this notion of being able to change, not only at the software level, but at the hardware level, um, vast um, intelligent devices uh, remotely is becoming more and more powerful and I would argue um, absolutely needed in order to realize this future. And you know, today there's a lot of, um, we're, see, we're searching for inspiration for these new architectures in nature quite often. See, you know, there's, you know, there's all this looking at neuromorphic computing. Um, if I were to sort of make a sort of analogy to that, the way to, to think about the reason why we're using the word adaptable a lot instead of traditionally we've talked about reconfigurable computing is because if you think about nature, the species that is most adaptable is always the species that has the most resilience and flourishes over the long run. You know, species that may be optimized for a particular environment and set of conditions, um, once that change, right, it's not a viable species anymore. So I think from that perspective, this, uh, it's a nuance, but I think thinking about these things as adaptable platforms on which you could then overlay domain-specific architectures and other changes uh, without changing out the, the physical infrastructure is really important. And along those lines, you know, John mentioned that AI, you know, despite the fact that it's already a significant business and there's all this innovation, we're still in the really early stages. And remember also that AI itself, if for the most part, isn't like the entire application. What's happening is these applications are becoming more intelligent by integrating some form of AI, right? So, so that, one last exponential, and I think, again, John had sh uh, shared this uh, in one of his talks. You know, there's an exponential rate of published papers on artificial intelligence. Um, and I would also say that, that what's happening, it's an, it's an interesting uh, paradox, right? Just as I said, that it's really uh, a challenge to be doing the, the silicon. Uh, we didn't really discuss it explicitly, but everybody knows that the cost of doing really advanced process technology devices is increasing uh, astronomically. At the same time, there's a demand to try and move from innovation concept to production deployment as rapidly as possible. So again, this speaks to the power of having a platform that you can do those updates even at the architectural level without having to do silicon spins. So you could innovate not at the cycle time of a silicon tape out, but at the cycle time of simply proving out the idea and then doing updates. In this case, I'm, I'm showing the example of the automotive industry. I think uh, if any of you have a Tesla, but you know, the general model, because uh, we participate quite, quite, quite a bit in the automotive industry, is that all the automotive a OEMs are looking to make sure that their feature platform, a car is a platform for them, can do over-the-air updates. So of course they can then deliver new driver and passenger experiences even after the car's been driven off the parking lot. They could address maybe flaws or security flaws uh, over the air. So again, that's just an example of the other aspect of why you want adaptable systems. And I kind of alluded to this before too, is that you know, especially with today, there's all these startups that talk about how they're accelerating AI or some, actually just a subset of some DNN. Um, now, that's not really the whole, the whole problem, right? What you really want to do is you want to accelerate 
the entire application, some of which and more of which is can have some portion of machine learning, but that's still not it. And so what distinguishes our capability is the very fact that not only can we accelerate many forms of neural networks, but we accelerate the other elements of the processing that isn't related to AI. Um, so, you know, and this is very powerful because, again, in fact, there's a lot of applications that are needed to drive, to process that explosion of data that doesn't have any AI in it at all. Um, and it's not only that we could accelerate the whole application, but we could accelerate many different kinds of applications, right? So you could do an ASIC that does accelerate the entire application, but by definition, an ASIC is something that's only going to be um, useful for a fairly limited set of applications, right? Now, because of this unique value, um, as you know, we are being now deployed in hyperscale data centers. Um, and the reason for it is because, in general, there's a model of pools of uniformed hardware that gets virtualized, and you can provision the amount of resources as needed by the workload that's running. So if you think about what I just described to you, this kind of adaptive platform is perfect for that because you could deploy the same kind of silicon hardware everywhere, um, but you could overlay on that whatever domain-specific architecture or just kernels um, for, for you know, sub-functions um, to the number of resources that you need, and you could change that dynamically while things are running. So again, this gives you an example of in whether it's public or private cloud, um, a really powerful and unique uh, model that you could do with this kind of a platform. So, you know, you, you say, well, that sounds great, so how come there isn't even broader deployment and usage of our platforms today? And, you know, the truth is, the heritage started out where we were, our users were hardware designers, right? And I'll talk about later, too, is that, of course, you know, we've moved tremendously from mainly be reconfigurable logic to you know, multi-core subsystems. So what we're doing now is we're developing a development environment to let people work um, at the proper level of abstraction, um, and again, supporting not only compute acceleration, which is what most people talk about when they talk about accelerators today, but also storage and network. And, you know, interesting thing about that, there's also a blurring of lines of uh, network smart NICs in terms of uh, acceleration um, as opposed to what traditionally you would do, you know, near the processor. So this is what, uh, this is a high level. You can see there's um, everything from the lowest hardware platform uh, through the libraries, interfacing to standard frameworks and using energy standard APIs. Giving a little bit more detail, so you can kind of see we abstracted away in the previous thing about the, the hardware. Um, you know, there's a silicon that today may be an FPGA. It may be uh, the Zinc SLC that we talked about. Um, and just above that, there would be a shell, and you can think about that as the uh, configuration that talks to the rest of the system that you don't change, right? That's fixed, the things that drive your memory, your PCIe, and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the next level, you have all these optimized libraries, um, and you can see that these libraries could be optimized for different domains including the XDNN, which is um, some IP that we have developed uh, to accelerate machine learning. And, and then from there, you know, we interface to industry standard frameworks um, and also APIs, and then therefore the developers can either just develop in those frameworks, um, develop in C++, but they don't have to know how to create the microarchitecture necessary to get the acceleration. It's, in effect, having like custom silicon underneath the hood without necessarily needing to be the designer of that custom silicon. Now, of course, this model supports people working also at the, the level that's closer to uh, the hardware, if you will. So we do have customers as well as we're working with ecosystems to develop these really optimized libraries and uh, where kernels are pre-compiled um, that, again, can be utilized by higher level application and system developers. So this has just been fairly recent, and you're going to see more of this, and, um, and that's uh, going to enable, I think, a lot more innovation once these types of development environments are out. So now to give you a couple of examples of you know, all the things I've been saying, um, and 
there's no particular reason why you're going to see a lot of examples of GPUs other than when we looked at some of these things, we're using Amazon's F1. I think everybody knows that you can um, get uh, CPU time, GPU time, as well as FPGA time in the Amazon F1 environment. So we kind of use that as at, at format. And this is just showing, again, that uh, point that the application here is a high-resolution imaging application. Um, and if all you're really doing is accelerating the CN portion of that, but you can't accelerate some of the pre-processing on the image and some of the other post-processing, then even if there's very good acceleration results on the machine learning aspect, um, our platform can achieve even better performance and actually at a much lower power, which um, you're going to see that as a common, a common theme also, and I think I'll explain that a bit later. But, you know, both of which are really critically important. I think that's the other really unique thing about where we are in the industry today is that not only are most of the workloads a little bit more throughput oriented, meaning that, you know, since it's a lot of image, these are processing on really parallel kinds of things that, you know, the pixels in the image don't really interact, but at the same time, you really care about latency. Um, in endpoint and edge applications, in fact, like a car, obviously you care about real, real-time performance. You can't have batch performance like you could do if all you're trying to do is, say, offline training, right? So inference and, and certainly endpoint and, and edge applications, uh, latency is very important. Another, okay, speaking of latency, <laughs> another application here is um, security detection, uh, you know, anomalous kinds of patterns uh, coming off of the network. And, you know, this is a good example because I kind of alluded to this earlier that there's a little bit of blurring of what's happening in terms of just network acceleration, but also just compute acceleration because you can now do a lot of computing near where the data is and whether that data is coming off of storage devices or from the network or some combination of those, these converged smart NICs, we're seeing a lot of that uh, trend. But basically, again, in this case, the FPGA, you can pretty much do all of that in the FPGA, and that does a few things. One, it gives you this higher performance, low latency, but the other thing is that since you're not sending data between the CPU and these accelerators or the NIC card um, or the NIC device, all the data stays in that one chip, so it actually has better security from the point of view of you're not, you know, there's not visible data um, on the interfaces. So this gets you kind of both the security that you're looking for as well as better latency. Um, and there's another point here that's really important is, which is why the, from a TCO perspective, this is a really valuable model, which is that if the CPU is doing some driver code to support the NIC, for, for instance, it, it is being used and it can't be used for some other kind of processing. Um, what a lot of architectures are seeing now is that you have the smart converged NIC and the FPJ or our Zinc kind of uh, products can fully offload that, therefore freeing up the CPU for other tasks and frankly in a, in a cloud environment, therefore generating, you know, monetizing that, that compute capability. And the last, uh, the last example I'll give is a smart city. Um, this is really, really big in a lot of different regions. Um, such as Asia, but of course, everywhere, I think security is one aspect of a smart city. There's also traffic flow control. But once again, you have uh, some form of, you are doing some image recognition, but you're doing a lot of other processing. There's a lot of different video sizes. There's transcoding going on. Then there's other kinds of uh, things like um, tagging the data, storing that in a database, retrieving data, all kinds of things having to do with, obviously, trying to recognize people in, Im in images. And, um, and again, uh, using the full capability, um, having the kernels and different DSAs specific for the types of processing all in the FPGA, um, there's significant uh, factors of improvement in latency as, as well as power. Okay, so um, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but just for those of you who don't follow our, our part of the industry very closely, just walk you through uh, the progression of architectural innovations, I said, you know, just like the general processor industry, it's never been just about process technology, it's also about innovation in architecture. So from a hardware perspective, you know, first FPGA 
um, also uh, released in the 1980, that spawned a whole industry, um, and, and basically, you know, enabling custom solutions, mainly, obviously, digital logic-focused solutions uh, for a variety of things. Ten years later, we introduced the first Vertex, which is a, a breakthrough from an architecture perspective, but it still is fundamentally an FPGA architecture. Now, the Vertex 2 Pro, the reason why I put that there, and even for those of you who are familiar with FPGAs, probably say, why is he putting Vertex 2 Pro? That wasn't exactly from a commercial perspective a raging success, but the reason why I put it there was that the first time there was an integrated processor on there, it was a PowerPC, and I say processor very specifically because it wasn't an SOC. There was um, some peripheral logic, but basically it didn't have the full um, system support that you would really need to make, uh, to make that usable by most applications, and that um, was a pretty significant reason why that wasn't broadly adopted, because it left too much exercise to the user to complete the rest of the SOC. Furthermore, it used up all the programmable resources just building out a usable processor subsystem. But I think it was really important that way back in 2000, there was a vision that, you know, um, there's a lot of power in not just having programmable logic, but having, you know, the microprocessor uh, closely coupled to that. The real breakthrough happened at the 28 nanometer node, which is around uh, 2010, um, when we introduced our first Zinc product. This is where we had a dual Cortex, full SOC, first and second level caches, memory, its own memory controller, peripheral bus, the full. You would look at that processor if you're not familiar, and it would just look like, um, you know, maybe an older generation applications processor on a phone, and certainly a pretty, still a pretty powerful and better processor. And that was integrated to, together with our 28 nanometer fabric. So at the, this point, we've had DSP blocks, we have Surges blocks, we have separate memory controllers. So it's a very rich architecture. And indeed, we have seen tremendous pickup of that, process, that product now being in the heart of these systems, as opposed to doing more peripheral kinds of functions and bridging and connectivity. So um, again, for those of you who don't follow us, this actually has been going on for nearly a decade. Um, and, and then skipping to almost today, um, the second generation of the Zinc, we call MPSOC, that has you know, four applications processors, two real-time processors, a bunch of other capabilities. The SOC has become much more powerful, as has the rest of the FPGA and since 16 nanometers. Um, I kind of skipped over uh, additional breakthroughs that we have technology that um, integrates multiple die, active die together on a silicon interposer. We call that stack silicon interconnect. And that also has played into the power and the capability of our product. And um, the next big quantum leap in architecture is what we call ACAP for Adaptive Compute Acceleration Platform, and ACAP for short. And it's really important that you understand that this is not an FPGA. It's not really even just the next evolutionary step of our Zinc class products. It really is a from scratch new heterogeneous platform. We, we use the word platform for a very clear reason, is it really is this flexible meta platform on which you can overlay multiple DSAs and kernels. Um, you still have a multi-core general purpose SOC, but there are other hardware and software programmable engines on there. And the first instance of an ACAP will be our 7 nanometer product, what we call um, Everest, which stay tuned for that. But anyways, we'll see that uh, coming in, um, the silicon coming out in 2019. And uh, this is sort of at a very high level, uh, some of the, the blocks. Now, if you're familiar with our products, they're very modular and the ACAP is even more so, very scalable. So these blocks, it's not that every single ACAP will have HBM stack memory, for instance, but there are product family members that, which will support that. Similarly, not every family will have very high performance ADCs and DACs. But there are some core things that will be on every um, ACAP, and that is this next generation fabric. Um, actually, I should just go to that. Um, is it, oh, well. Never mind. I guess verbally it's there. There'll be another graphic. There's going to be a network on a chip. Um, in many of them, but not all, there'll also be a new architecture that is both hardware and software programmable, which actually, just before the keynote, there was a presentation on that. So if you missed that, I'll give you a very high-level um, summary of that. But a very, very powerful platform. 
Um, and again, this is further the capability of adaptive computing. Um, it will make um, the capability to swap, if you will, kernels and DSAs in and out uh, more rapidly with um, less design restrictions around that. Um, it is multi-market, so this isn't, there's a lot of uh, discussion around data center and cloud, but just to be clear, because of its, its flexibility and adaptability, it will serve all markets. Again, the architecture is scalable, so it will be in automotive applications, it will be in the cloud applications, and uh, things in between, communications infrastructure, some of the usual areas that we're quite strong in. And it will absolutely be software programmable from the get-go, um, but underneath the hood, of course, there will be hardware programmability. So I kind of talked about this at a high level of what some of the constituent, this is sort of, um, I, I know that you're, you're getting very deep dive details from some of the other presenters. Um, being a CEO, this is CEO level block diagram. <laughs> um, despite all of John's generosity about what a great technologist I am. Um, but, you know, and, and the block that I talked about, that hardware software program engine, that was just described a bit just early this morning. There'll be other elements that through the course of the year that we'll, we will give you indeed more detail. But just a couple of uh, factoids about how much more powerful is this than our current 16 nanometer products, which are really quite powerful, is in terms of machine learning inference for like networks and like, you know, uh, conditions and so forth, you know, it'll be 20x higher performing. Um, in terms of communications bandwidth, I had mentioned that some of these are being used in 5G deployments as well as massive MIMO. Uh, the bandwidth that we have will be 4x the, the communications bandwidth. And then from a transceiver perspective, this is now getting more into like some of the things, some of the aspects of, you know, even our traditional FPGAs that are really critical but continues to be critical, uh, you know, it, products will support uh, transceivers up to 112 gig uh, PAM4. And, you know, again, just to give a couple of um, points, you know, you heard me talk several times about um, its better performance and it's also more power efficient. Um, and then I mentioned that, you know, there's going to be this new block that's both hardware and software pro program. Well, this is, again, CEO-level detail, the architecture. <laughs> yes, indeed, it is a multi-core architecture, but again, this is not just any other you know, multi-core VLIW kind of architecture. Um, there is, we have a tool suite that actually does placement and, and the scheduling and the interconnect the pol topology can be hardware program, but it, there's a software programming element as well. And I kind of verbally talk through some of the performance. And then again, the power is significantly uh, more efficient. Performance again, quite, quite again, throttled by power density and even thermal gradients and things like that on the die. Um, so, you know, we'll, we continue to a combination optimize things at the algorithm level as well as, uh, of course, over time at the hardware level. But this gives you a flavor for some of the things that we're adding to ACAP, um, the ACAP architecture and family. And I think I, I mentioned that I never really discussed why it is we can get both higher performance, um, high throughput, and low latency, and lower power. Um, this is a little bit of, I guess, a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> These days, especially because of the kind of the, the focus on machine learning, we're kind of getting into this frenzy about tops. Like everybody talks about tops, right? <laughs> and um, again, for, for those like myself who've been in the industry for a while, this, this absolutely reminds me of the megahertz wars instead of like the 90s, right? It, it's, you know, it's, it's akin to peak bandwidth on an interconnect or a bus, right? You know, it, it's really not what matters. What really matters is the application acceleration time, right? We're achieving these things at generally hundreds of megahertz to maybe around a gigahertz or so, as opposed to multiple gigahertz. And a lot of it is because with the adaptability of our general architecture, we have a lot of distributed on-trip memory. And the, and the connectivity of that, and even the configuration in some cases in terms of ports, can be customized. So you can not only optimize the data path and the data flow, but you can optimize the memory hierarchy as well as the bandwidth, and there's massive amounts of entrepreneur bandwidth. So that's why, especially if you're innovating at the architectural level, and you're picking architectures and algorithms that are optimized for the application at hand, we could run, we could give up factors of frequency performance, and actually that's a good thing, right? So at the high level, that's why we are able to do both 
performance and power efficiency, and a lot of cases, low latency, even though there's a lot of throughput. Okay, and you know, I, I kind of alluded to this before. Um, you know, we will produce, e even when we have that hardware programmable engine, that multi-core architecture, uh, there'll, there'll be absolutely still a reason to also have soft forms of, um, of overlay architectures. So this XDNN, um, this isn't something, you could get this today. We have this on our 1600 products. We, will ha we have a roadmap of how we're going to continue to improve this over time when we have ACAP and 790 and beyond, because you know, there's still, as I mentioned, great value in having um, the complete flexibility of our FPJ fabric in addition to when we have this, um, this multi-core hybrid, if you will, hardware and software pro programmable architecture. And, um, and we will have the, the tools, the compilers, network optimizers, quantizing uh, optimization tools, and the full runtime to support this overlay architecture. Um, and again, um, we've already had releases of it. We're on the same piece of silicon. We've had factors of improvements as we optimize each of these factors. Um, and this is also going to be shared today, I think. <laughs> but anyways, in this uh, conference, I don't remember the exact schedule, but this is being uh, presented by some of uh, the, the, the team. Um, and just one more uh, for good measure. You know, we think this is such a prestigious uh, conference that not only did we have multiple uh, papers, but uh, DeFi, you may have heard, we, we recently have a deal to acquire them, and so I get to reference DeFi's architectures as well. And they have two overlay architectures, one Aristotle for accelerating CNN, as well as another architecture they, they call Descartes, which is for more like LSTM. And again, because those are different, Right, they can optimize those um, the, for those networks and those applications. They also have, you know, fantastic innovative technology around pruning and other kinds of um, compression, quantization, and optimization. And, and again, you know, same piece of silicon. You know, will run RxDNN, can run theirs, and in the future, um, it will run um, in, in ACAP and Summer Nine. We're doing that out. So uh, that is um, basically the talk and. Uh, I'll leave you with, uh, this is the, uh, the mission of Xilinx today. Um, hopefully it now makes sense <laughs> that uh, I think in the next era of computing uh, is gonna require this adaptability um, and this enables intelligence from endpoint uh, to the edge of the cloud and uh, we think that we're developing platforms to get help empower all the innovators and application developers out there that will build that future. So thank you very much, um, I think I've Thank you, Victor. Uh, so I think we have time for questions, if people want to step up to the microphone. Let me, let me ask one while people arrive up there. So one of the challenges, I think, that you have at Xilinx is to figure out when do you actually go build a module that's embeddable in the FPGA environment? When do you just let people use conventional FPGA? And it depends on a lot of things, what the performance gain is, how many user, how big the user community is. How do you make those kinds of decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. And from the first day I joined Xilinx, this is a uh, you know, discussion and debate that's been happening. And I think there's both a kind of a technical aspect, and then, of course, there's a business aspect. You know, the technical aspect I look at is um, if we're going to put something hard, that's going to be generally in, in most of the products that we do. So it really should have enough you know, programmability and flexibility that it's useful for at least a few different domains and markets. Because if we do one that's special, um, you know, then okay, that's really great for that. It's sort of, if you will, in the spectrum of, you know, ASICs versus where we are, um, you know, we don't really want to be in the ASIC realm, but on the other hand, you know, there are cases where th there is enough, um, I guess what I would say, enough, uh, you know, return to sort of induce in some more of a hardening, if you will. But in every case, you know, short of when this just industry stands like a codec, right? We always look to see is there some element of the hardware programming because that's what we're really good at. And again, this um, you know this hardware architecture I described, you know, we're just not the next guy coming out with a VIW multi-core architecture. If that's all it was, I mean, maybe we'll do a good job. But you know, I think there's a little bit of a hubris to say that we'll be better than anybody else. But we know that we are the best in understanding the trade-off between doing hardware and software programmability. So we generally look for that. Yeah, good answer. Okay, let's go over here. Hi, Craig Davies, uh, Huawei. So 
should we take this as a future trend for FPGA in general, which is we're moving to a world of CGRA plus overlay so you don't have to program an FPGA directly? Um, you know, who, I, I can see how that enables a lot of stack of people now. So people still doing prototyping maybe to obviously anybody in a cloud environment wanting to be very agile on hardware to maybe even chip architects. Um, is that a general trend for FPGA? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess since you mentioned the word prototyping, I'll, I, I want to touch on that a little bit because, again, for those who don't follow us very carefully, there's this, there's this feeling as though, oh, FPGA is mainly for prototyping. You don't go to production in that. That's, that's really not true and hasn't been true for quite some time. I'll give you one tidbit. We have, we've shipped over, I think, 60 million units in the automotive markets alone in FPGAs and pure, pure FPGAs with a little bit of zinc right now because zinc is starting to come up quite, quite strongly. So just now setting that aside, but I absolutely do believe that by making this more accessible, allowing people to create their own architectures without having to understand things really close to the metal, that's definitely going to enable more innovators, and people will see the power of the platform, it, you know, there'll be a, a virtuous cycle. Having said that, you know, I showed you the stack. You know, we are still going to have people that are going to be implementing things at the RTL level, and then the in-between level, which is people creating optimized libraries, right, that really are creating kernels that are pre, um, you know, designed such that it's understood that there's going to be a tremendous amount of acceleration. Then for other application designers, they can simply call those things through APIs and then make use of it without having to architect. So I think there's really room for operating at various levels of design abstraction. Great. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, Alan Cantor, Malatech. Uh, fantastic presentation, Victor. Uh, Thank you. Great vision. Um, uh, so, look, looking on this, just look, looking beyond or, or, or in more, into more detail, are you going to be supporting a dynamic partial reconfiguration at last or with this architecture? Okay, so since you phrased it that way, I know you have looked at this technology before. Absolutely. In fact, I kind of alluded to that obliquely. A, our products today are already much more usable than it was. Um, in complete candor, when I arrived, you know, I, I heard about the, the feature and I said, this is great. And then, <laughs> then some of the people in the field said, well, it's kind of almost like a science project. We've moved way beyond that. Already in our 16 nanometers, it's much more robust. Customers are using it. And you can imagine in the cloud, it's, right, it's, it's incredibly valuable because it's sort of like preemptive multitasking, but at the hardware level. And ACAP's going to make it even more general, happen more rapidly. Right, so even absolutely. At the, even at the, um, at the runtime level, at the dynamic, you know, like an if-then-else switching in, dynamically switching in the IP and changing the IP? Uh, yes, we're working on trying to do the entire stack. And, and, you know, again, you know, by the way, some of this is like, you know, with Amazon and some of the other people are doing FAS business model, you know, there's our development environment underneath the hood working hand-in-glove with their development environment. So to some degree, you know, each each of our customers look at special needs of their customers, if you will. But yes, that's the idea. Excellent. Thank Great. You. Okay. Hi, uh, David Monday, Google. Uh, so for the overlay architectures that are emerging now, uh, embedded with programmable fabric, as well as the um, Arden uh, application processors and the real-time processors, what are your folks' position on tooling? It seems like thread parallelism can be very important in order to extract performance from these architectures. How does the tooling play in here? Yeah, it, it is definitely critical. And, you know, obviously we're doing things and we're working with others who are trying to enable an ecosystem around that. Um, we're still thinking through a lot, of, um, a lot of our strategies around open source, by the way, too. Right? So I think, um, you know, we are definitely ourselves producing more of the entire stack, the runtime, but also, um, you know, we're trying to enable uh, ecosystem and, you know, there's a lot of discussion uh, stay tuned in terms of some of the things we're doing, we'll do around open source. Uh, but your, your point's well taken. Absolutely, tooling is really critical to enable broader use of this pretty powerful platform, but it's the ease of use issue, right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ron Nicholson. Um, I'm a hardware engineer. This is a hardware conference, and Xilinx seems to be doing a great job of providing uh, heterogeneous solutions to to various problems from the point of view of a hardware engineer. But a lot of domains, the expertise is in software and research. Uh, can you talk a little about any advances uh, being made to allow uh, you know, the 
the, the, the solutions to be ported from the software world to the hardware solutions you're providing? Yeah, and um, you know, I, I, I was trying to um, convey some of that, and, and again, um, you know, it's not that in any way that we're declaring that we've solved that problem, but part of it is to make sure that we can interface all the way to any standard frameworks, right, like TensorFlow. Um, and, you know, and in fact, it was, it was on there, but, you know, even not, which isn't, well, actually it is using university, but even in the community, maker community, uh, Python. I mean, we, we have uh, targets and we have things where people could uh, work in Python. We've had interns that have never used FPGAs, you know, come in and one day they can bring up applications uh, with some of those interfaces. So we are absolutely doing that. And I, and I really think, you know, the, the, part of the reason why we, we called ACAP a platform is because the way I look at it is Xilinx makes a meta platform because our customers then take that and create their own optimized platform. Right? And so this is all about empowering innovators, right? And so some of the innovators, like hardware people, are very familiar with us, and they just want to see that we you know, fix a few of the, the irksome things about partial reconfiguration, for instance. But others, like, they don't really want to know that level of hardware, but they really like the ability of controlling data flow, memory flow, um, and changing things as soon as they have a new algorithm, right, or a new network they want to test out. So we're definitely going to do that. Software may eat the world, but it doesn't run by itself. <laughs> it needs hardware, right? <laughs> uh, hi, Jeff Smith. Uh, maybe a software-oriented question as well. So I saw in the slides that uh, we're moving lots of things from the boxes of the host across that you know, inconvenient PCI link over to the, <laughs> the new platform. What's going to be in place you know, as far as throwing a lifeline to people who are still half on the you know, host CPU world about uh, running things in you know, CPU host with maybe a little less pain than uh, the PCIe. Is, is Open Fabric still part of the story for ACAP or uh, is that diminished nowadays? Well, you know, I guess there's two things. The reason why you, I show that a lot is because, um, you know, a lot of these examples are in the cloud and again, just that's what you have available in the cloud. Now, if I showed a lot of the embedded applications with Zinc, well, we have a native host, right, that is both low latency and high bandwidth, um, and it's not PCIe, right? It's an AXI kind of thing. Um, a as you may know, we're also supporting um, part of this uh, C6 um, architecture, and because we're flexible, we could support CAPI and, and many other things. Um, but I guess what I would say is, you know, the, the data center and a lot of things are very standards-based, so we will support the main standards. But we, we did, as well as other like-minded companies, feel that, yeah, there are some things lacking in, um, you know, it's getting better, I guess, but there was a period of time where it didn't look like PCIe was uh, progressing very much. And um, so I think, you know, what we're going to do is we're, we're very... Um, we, know we believe in open standards, but we, we, we believe in standards that are going to push the envelope. And so I think if it fits those things, we could do that. From a more closer integration, like there's a lot of discussion these days about you know, in-package integration. I, I mentioned it briefly. Like we've been doing silicon interposers since 28 nanometers, so in production. We absolutely know how to do that. You saw we have an on-chip knock that could be extended. Uh, these are not product announcements. These are just <laughs> technical chats. But I, we definitely have the technology and the infrastructure to do stuff. Right. Thank you for your answer, and thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Uh, Antonio Kuhn, uh, Amadeus. So I'm one of the few software engineers here. <laughs> um, so it's uh, from a software engineer point of view. Uh, we are using a lot of containers and related yeah. tools like uh, Kubernetes, OpenStack, OpenShift, and so forth for transparent deployment between cloud, from on-premises to the cloud, and so forth. So my question is now, if we have part of our application that are accelerated on, on F, let's say, on Xilinx FPGA, how are we going to handle this kind of containerization of the, of the IP, of the design that we are going to, to need to load from our on-premise to, uh, to Amazon or to the other cloud providers? So that's a great question. Um, and first, again, a bit of candor. Back when I used to do engineering, I was a hardware designer, so I'm not going to be able to give you a huge amount of depth. But having said that, I'm definitely aware that you know, we, we are going to containerize things. We have um, some of our IP already containerized in Docker. And we had an interaction with, uh, I can't say whom, but where we did it the hard way first, and it took weeks to sort of bring up um, 
a, a processor in, in our FPGA accelerator, and then we had Docker, and like in minutes they brought it up. So um, that is the trend. I think it's, it's similar to some of the other discussions, is that we have an extremely powerful platform. We understand to enable more innovators, we have to lower the barrier, and we have to try and provide an experience that m more applications and software developers are familiar with, right? And that is absolutely um, you know, one of our strategic goals here. Um, hi, Anand Dyer, Samsung. Um, so you, you mentioned, you know, two and a half T interposer, right? So I want to fast forward you to a, a more mature sort of two and a half T, 2.1 D, 3 D, you know, stacking ecosystem. Um, so, so the disaggregation that that would, you know, allow, right? Would that sort of diminish the value of this, you know, very highly integrated, complex, you know, programming and synchronization and, and parallelization platform like ACAP? What's your view on, you know, that future? Yeah. So. Um you trail off a little bit, but if I, so if I don't answer the full question, <laughs> um, elaborate. But uh, the, the ACAP architecture, we will have product families that are using the interposer technology. So, you know, the physical level, um, you know, a lot of them will be monolithic, but there's easy ways to sort of, uh, and we will, in production ship more of these two and a half D interposer kinds of things. And then you mentioned true 3D. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of work because, again, I, we've been the leader. In fact, up until fairly recently, we're the only ones shipping TSMC's, right, TSMC's COAS technology. That's what they call, what we call SSIT. Um, I, I guess what I'd say is we thought a lot about what we would do um, with true 3D stacking. And, you know, there's some easy ways you could even just mentally extrapolate what we might do now that we have a knock, but there are other ways that are more fine grain that we could also do. So I think that would be very powerful. I think, you know, frankly, you know, a big issue is thermal. Again, once again, thermal, because now you have to about, think about thermal, um, you know, escapes from stacked uh, digital die. And, and then there's a lots of other algorithmic and tool things that we need to do. But we, um, yeah, we, we do think about that a lot. Okay, Victor, thanks. It's great to see a CEO that can still give a technical talk, huh? <laughs> Let's thank Victor. Thank you.